reimagine Jackson Street a transportation master plan. We will select the chair as we're waiting for the presenters to arrive. If I and if there are no um, objections, since I'm already in this seat, I guess I can play that role. Any objections? Okay. Um, and we ask the members uh, if, if, any, if there's any, uh, anyone here or anyone would like to receive public input, that it'll be accepted. Do we have any? Yeah. If you wish to speak, please complete and submit a public input form, form which can be obtained from staff. And please come to the podium if you have anything to say. the day before yesterday so we're waiting for the presenter patiently I guess that's correct If you'd like to join us <laughs> over here. I feel weird in your seat. Oh, I'm not in your seat. Yeah, I am. Uh-huh. Or do we have, no, we have an extra seat on this side. I waited at 305. If not, I'll join the meeting. Oh, don't we have anything to say? If there's a staff overview, and if there's any public comment. Hmm. Did you guys select the chair? <laughs> yes, we By default. Whoever sits in that chair gets elected. Huh? Um, Madam Council Chair, um, we do have our presenter here, so okay. she's pulling it up right now. Please have a staff overview. I'll provide that real quick. So uh, appreciate everyone coming here today for the joint workshop. This is for the Reimagine Jackson Street project, and this is a city county project uh, that kicked off back in January. And what it is is we're trying to develop a impl implementable transportation plan for Jackson Street from A Street to Fairfield. So it goes from the city to the county, and we're looking at ways to address safety and mobility within the corridor. And the purpose of today is for the consultant WSP to uh, discuss some of the concepts, what's come out of the public survey. We had over, I believe, 330 uh, survey responses, so wanted to let you know how that went, what the community is saying, um, and then get a little bit of your input before they go in and uh, refine and really develop the plan. Um, they're expected to finalize that plan in October, so there's going to be a big production phase, but we wanted to get your input early on and let you guys know what the community is saying. Uh, so I have Catherine Prince with me, who is the lead consultant on this project, and she's going to go through a couple of slides and ask you guys some questions about the concepts and your input on this plan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we were a little delayed coming in. 
Thank you again for having us and meeting with us today. Um, let's begin with a quick run of introductions. I have with me, I'm Catherine Prince, the lead for the uh, Jackson Street uh, project. Uh, my background is in transportation planning, so I bring to the project about 20 years of uh, planning as well as implementation experience. With me is Jay Eber. He is our traffic engineer for the project. And online, I have, uh, we have a couple of folks. Do we have them? They should, yes. Yes. We have uh, Charles Warren, who is our market analyst, Peter Walt and Alfonso, who are financial planning specialists, and Ali Riley, who is looking at our social vulnerability as we go through our improvements, recommendations. So today's agenda is um, a quick project overview, including the background and what we've heard from the community so far. Also, we want to give you a preview of the items we are going to discuss with the community this evening at 5.30. So all the brochures you have in your hand is part of our interactive workshop. We'll share with you what we have planned. And uh, towards the end of this meeting, we want to hear from you. So that's really our focus and goal for this afternoon's meeting with you. We want to understand and hear from you how we can support you and the community to bring this project to fruition. Um, what have we not heard from the community so far, or what have, we not, what have we not considered so far? What are the gaps? And the second portion of the uh, meeting today, workshop today, will be interactive. So at that time, we encourage you to please share your thoughts and ideas with us. Uh, we rely on you to bring us, uh, to share the, uh, your local knowledge. We bring the expertise, and our recommendations will ba be based on uh, local experience that we'll hear from you. Quick overview on the project. Uh, the, study area is from A Street on the east end all the way to Fairfield Drive. We've broken the uh, corridor into three segments because there's distinctly, um, they are very distinct characteristics that bring them together. And here's a draft vision statement we've uh, worked together with the community to develop. It basically reads, in 10 years, Jackson Street will be an east-west gateway between the city of Pensacola and Escambia County that operates as a lower, a slower street connecting non-vehicle modes, that's walking and biking, and transit. It will have an internationally diverse community fabric with enhanced transportation and upgraded utility infrastructure. It will have vibrant community nodes that include local businesses, community gathering spaces, and recreational spaces. People of all ages and abilities can safely and conveniently walk, bike, or ride on the street. So this was pulled together through a variety of our interactions with the community. So with the vision statement, uh, here are our goals through the project. Uh, as Caitlin introduced, we are looking to develop an inclusive vision plan that is also implementable. And during the course of the first half of this project over the last five months, our goal had been to capture all the diverse ideas and views and perspectives and provide opportunities for everyone to be heard. So the project has a couple of phases. We are in phase one, and this phase is really listening to the community and coming up with a concept plan. The next fear, uh, phase is expected next year, where we'll go after funding. So how do we get these ideas funded and implemented? Once we secure the funding, we'll then go into engineering design and construction. So we are, are looking at about three to four years before we can begin construction. Whoops. So within the first phase, we are in step two uh, today, as of right now. The first step was to gather and listen to the community's needs 
desires, challenges. We also gather data on what's on the ground and uh, information on planned projects from the city, the county, and the various departments. The step we are in today, which is the developed phase, we've matched community feedback, uh, pulled together our analysis and our findings to come to you with a menu of options that we'll be presenting to you, both to you as well as the community today. The next step would be to come up with that design conceptual plan and also combine that with an implementation plan. Overview of what we've done so far as for, uh, to engage the community. So today's public meeting this evening will mark the final input phase, community input phase. Over the last five months, we've spent a majority of the time just listening and gathering information. In February, we met with community champions um, and did a walking audit with the city and county staff. In March, we, did, we had three pop-up uh, locations around Jackson Street where we communicated with the public and got feedback and input. We also had our first public workshop with the community both in person and virtual. And um, today, sorry, in April, we had a workshop with city and county staff we also did a public survey, which, uh, as Caitlin mentioned, we received a good amount of response. And uh, in May, today, we have the workshop and the community meeting. So we have been engaging the community on, a, on varied um, methods, from sending postcards, mailing postcards through social media, uh, regular email updates, and through Earn media, which is social, uh, this, which is press releases and interviews. As Caitlin mentioned previously, we've got we got a good response rate. Uh, response: <laughs> the survey about 300 people responded online, three, uh, 30 people pop-ups, as well as uh, we got about 80 people participating in our first public workshop. And uh, in the survey, there were three languages, English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And majority of the people lived near Jackson Street. That's 53%. So we got a good, um, a good input from the local residents. So with that, uh, here's a preview of today's public workshop. We'll not be going into the detail of every slide, um, but just to give you an idea of what we'll be sharing with the community and the feedback we'll be soliciting. Um, so we'll be presenting what we heard from the community, then the tactics on how the community wants to address uh, the priorities, which are the three priorities we've uh, identified based on feedback. Then we'll have an interactive portion, which provides a menu of options so we can get their feedback. And based on what we hear today uh, at the public meeting, we will design our recommendations. So this is what we heard. Uh, not surprisingly, we heard the same priorities across all forums, which is um, virtual, in-person public, pop-up meetings, as well as the survey. Safety, accessibility, and mobility are the number one priority for the community. Next is to celebrate and preserve the community's identity. And third is to increase access to open spaces. So these are the top three. There were others identified as well, which will definitely be part of our recommendations, but our uh, focus for today's workshop is gonna be the three, top three. And what the community said within safe mobility is they would like to see separated walking and biking facilities. They would like to see safe crossings with AD improvements and make sure all these infrastructure has co-benefits and doesn't cause undue burden. When the community said preserve our identity and the community, they want to achieve it by celebrating historic structures and using art in community spaces. And third, when they said increase access to parks and open spaces, they would like to see us carve out parks for children, outdoor spaces like plazas, throughout the corridor, as well as provide access to Jackson Creek, Potato Bay, and downtown. 
a quick preview, we have an initial draft of potential connections. Um, so to the east and to the west, if you can see in the pink line, uh, connecting Perito Bay and all the way east to 19th Avenue. And north-south, uh, connecting Jackson Street to Jackson Creek, as well as a proposed project, which is a Jack Jackson Creek restoration project, which the county is uh, working on pulling together now. So we'll solicit feedback uh, from the community on this. And the interactive portion of the workshop with the community is going to really rely on before and after simulations. And that's the brochure you have uh, right next to you. So we have a virtual option as well as the in-person option. During the in-person um, meeting, the brochure will be used as an aid. Um, so we have uh, options for the three segments that we identified. From One is F Street, the other one is Grandview, and 61st Street. So we're looking at uh, three different options um, for each of the streets. Uh, I won't go into the details of uh, what these options are. I encourage you to join us this evening to hear more. And uh, after the visuals, we want to ask some more information because we weren't able or we haven't shared all the options available. We want to have some menu of options that the community prefers. Um, so we have, uh, we're looking at preferences for major inter uh, intersections, minor intersections, that is the smaller intersections, and along the street, the segments, how do we incorporate safety? So uh, with that, um, we'll proceed to the workshop uh, portion of our meeting t this afternoon. <coughs> and I'll pass the baton to Jay Aber to lead the safety portion of this workshop. Thanks, Catherine. So like Catherine said, I'm Jay Aber, with WSP traffic engineer, um, and did the traffic analysis and safety analysis on the corridor. The, I think you all probably have an intuition about this. The primary issue in terms of perception and actual safety is walking and biking on this corridor. And a lot of it is related to the speed of, of cars driving on the corridor. So most people have told us in our meetings they really don't feel safe walking, biking. There are a lot of locations without um, sidewalks or where sidewalks are spotty or people may be forced into the street. There's not a lot of safe crossings. And especially towards the western end, we have a lot of schools down there. Um, and the school boundaries do extend across Jackson Street. So you have the possibility for students um, elementary through high school age crossing the street. Um, there have been 13 serious injury crashes and three fatal car crashes on the corridor in five years, the most recent five years data we have, which is a really pretty high number for a corridor like this. Uh, and the amount of uh, walking, or sorry, the amount of traffic we have on there. Um, three of those involve pedestrians, two of them involve cyclists. And if you can imagine, uh, that's about a third of the crashes involve cyclists, the, the actual amount of people walking and biking versus people driving. Uh, there's much, much fewer uh, people walking and biking, so walking and biking on the corridor does represent a really over, uh, overly high risk uh, of being in one of these fatal or serious injury traffic crashes. <clears throat> the biggest areas of concern are the major intersections, so uh, on the western end, Fairfield Drive, uh, and then the central area, New Warrington, uh, those were the two highest intersections. Uh, but then also a lot of minor intersections in there as well, from Green Street West to Old Quarry Road, uh, and then further out, uh, 49th, um, 57th, 61st Street. Uh, there was a number of, of locations that had were a little bit more minor intersections that still had a high number of these uh, fatal and serious injury traffic crashes. <coughs> Like I mentioned, speed is a big, a big issue. We did speed studies out there. We found people, um, the, what we commonly use the 85th percentile speed of drivers to set speed limits. And you, the speed, ideally, are, are within a few miles per hour of the speed limits. Uh, when you go to the far eastern end, people are driving pretty, pretty close to the speed limit, um, 25, 30 miles per hour on the eastern end. As you go further west, speeds get higher and higher until you get over towards Fairfield Drive and the 85th percentile speed there is 46 miles per hour with the posted speed at, at 35. And 
you know, that's an area where we do have uh, the elementary schools and the high schools, so you get higher and higher speeds when you have uh, more possibility of school-age kids uh, out on the street. The public, uh, what we've heard from them, they recognize this is an issue. They like drivers uh, slowed down. Um, it's a pretty common concept in traffic safety to get, to get cars to slow down because as the cars slow down, the drivers both are, are, are it's easier for them to stop uh, if there's something in the road, it's either for, easier for them to perceive something, and also if they do happen to hit a person, then there's much less likely uh, chance that that person will be killed or seriously injured um, by that car. <clears throat> So I mentioned sidewalks, uh, bike facilities. There are, are no bike facilities on Jackson Street today. Sidewalks, this shows a heat map. The, the green areas have sidewalks. Um, and then you kind of see it's sort of spotty on the eastern end. And then when you get west of New Warrington, there really are no sidewalks at all, uh, all the way out to Fairfield Drive. <clears throat> so uh, again, having those, those pedestrians and um, especially um, handicapped people, uh, physically disabled, uh, that are in, in, in wheelchairs, other mobility assisted devices, that are really forced onto the street because there's no way for them to go through the grass. Um, and, and cyclists as well that can use the sidewalk um, if they choose to. Uh, we've seen a lot of people out there kind of trudging through the grass on the side of the road and, and walking through um, the gravel and things out there to, to stay out of the path of vehicles. So we're really looking at proven safety countermeasures, um, guidance from the Federal Highway Administration, from the National Association of City Transportation Officials, NACTO, um, and then rely a lot on the Highway Safety Manual, Crash Modification Clearinghouse for picking out these proven safety countermeasures. So we're really using things that have a track record of, of working, uh, of working on corridors like this, of addressing the specific safety issues that we've seen out there. So uh, to kind of just sum it up in general, the biggest uh, safety things we can do, again, are slowing cars down, using traffic calming, uh, so that cars naturally slow down, also reducing the posted speed limit, um, and, and really focusing on reducing that vehicle speed. And then at intersections doing specific treatments at those. Uh, Catherine showed some pictures of what we'll, we'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of traffic signals out there at minor intersections that are uh, that may or may not be necessary and could be swapped out for something like a compact roundabout or a four-way stop that may improve safety quite a bit. Um, so looking at those, um, those specific improvements at those intersections. And also I want to mention we did do an analysis for traffic operations and found that really the road can be two lanes basically for the foreseeable future. There's uh, the traffic operations are pretty good. Um, we even looked at what would happen if there was a substantial diversion of traffic from Cervantes onto Jackson Street and found that we'd really have to almost double the traffic on Jackson Street to see any kind of really poor level of service. Um, so keeping the road at two lane will help keep it the slower speed, allow us to do more traffic calming, reduce that distance that pedestrians and cyclists need to cross the road uh, and make it as safe as possible. So um, with that all said, we wanted to really ask you all, is there, are we missing anything? Are there things you all have heard from constituents aside? You know, we've, we've been doing uh, a pretty robust engagement process, but you all have been engaging with these folks, your constituents for years. Are there other things that you've heard that we've missed? Um, any ideas? And then also, um, kind of similar question we'll ask for the other things. There's, are there uh, key stakeholders, partnerships we should be looking into? Um, funding is critical. Um, are, there, are there ideas on funding these improvements? Um, and are there any other potential hurdles? Are there anything you can see with what we've talked about so far, just this part related to traffic that you see that could be a roadblock or hurdle to realizing this, this transformation? Where are your bus stops? So, uh, the, bus, the bus stops are on the west end only. There are no bus stops on the east end of the corridor. So, uh, the items that was not listed on the map when we showed multimodal connections was increasing transit coverage. So we have noted that the entire stretch of Jackson Street is not very well served currently by transit. Also, the transit shelters, the bus stop shelters, are inadequate in terms of ADA access, uh, 
cover shelter or seating. So those will be definitely part of our um, recommendations. Yes, ma'am. Um, because of the pictures, I'm assuming you haven't been able to partner with the um, electric company and do undergrounding while doing this? We have not had that conversation yet, but uh, we will have that conversation in the coming months for sure. If, if that is an option or how we can work that out. And it just seems if we're going to t undertake yes. something like this, then we want to really be thinking forward and take care of those kinds of infrastructure issues that we'll see down the road. Yeah, cer certainly utilities were something that, you know, when we do a lot of these kind of complete streets, planning projects, talking about bicycle, pedestrian, safety, um, we don't usually talk as much about utilities, um, but utilities was a big topic of discussion with the public, uh, both the electrical utilities um, from a kind of a, you know, it's, it's, it's cluttered out there to, to put trails and bicycle cycle tracks and things like that out there with the poles but also from a resiliency angle and poles being knocked down and then also the trees as well, having to trim the trees so aggressively as they've been trimmed. Um, so those have been things that we've, we've heard and people have talked about. And then also stormwater utilities as well. Um, and you know, we can't, we have no real ability to mitigate protecting trees if they're in the, in the line of utilities. Yeah, the, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that's been a concern of, you know, how, you know, people really love the trees and how can we work with utilities and the trees and, and make sure we can keep the character of the corridor um, working with the utilities. I have just a practical question. Uh, you said people are walking through the grass right now to avoid um, being hit. Is the grass something you can deal with immediately? Uh, is it clear enough that you could mow it down so that when people do have to take to the side, they don't have to go through weeds and snakes or whatever is out there? Um, have you thought about, you know, just a kind of a practical mowing of the um, right of way? That's not something we've talked about because we've been kind of more focused on the for bigger the picture, but I think that's something, I mean, that could be a challenge just because of the need for the property owners to maintain that. Mm -hmm. um, so that'd be something that the county or the city would, would need to take on if they were to do something like that. Right. It, it just seems to me that it's going to be three or four years before you have this. So in between, maybe we could save somebody by cutting the grass. Yeah, no, that's a great idea and, and thinking yeah, about kind of interim. Of the county, I understand, the county is putting some sidewalks oh, um, for about a mile, and that should be going in the short term. I understand it next year. Jerry, yes, sir. We should see for that. Sidewalks will be sidewalks from uh, 65th to Fairfield. Very good. And they'll be totally ADA accessible yes, with the curb cuts and all of those necessary things. Yes. The, the other thing I was interested in was the um, people's interest in water access, uh, including Jackson Creek. Um, will your plans actually uh, encourage that kind of public access, or um, have you thought of it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the connections that we've proposed primarily come because of what the community has asked us. Mm -hmm. And uh, through our project, we want to work with the county to see how we can connect Jackson Street, perhaps, through a multimodal path mm -hmm. to Jackson Creek. And that might be in a multi-year project. That might be a separate project. But we have a long-term vision that that is going to be a part of uh, the connections, for sure. Absolutely. Now would be the time to, have to yes. do that. Yes, and Thank we've you. been communicating with the natural resources team that are uh, they already secured funds mm -hmm. to restore Jackson's uh, Creek at some portion. So we'll be working with them to, you know, make sure that our vision here can be implemented. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, do we want to go through? Uh, 
really quick uh, share with you um, what we have here. Um, so have an idea of what we are proposing um, or the different sections. Uh, if you want to follow on your brochure, perhaps it's easier. Um, on F Street, there are a few options. In option one, um, we are showing some parking spaces are uh, being repurposed for uh, storm water. Um, there, are, there are some parking spaces being repurposed for bicycle bike share and perhaps uh, temporary parklets depending on the time of the year, um, potentially extending the sidewalk uh, for revitalized um, businesses. That's option one. Option two shows a variation where a portion of the um, parking space is being repurposed for a multi-use path. So that is dedicated space for someone uh, walking, biking. And option three, um, the small variation there is on the corner of the lot is a public uh, plaza, uh, which can be used for people to simply hang out. So that's uh, op um, the options for F Street. The option for um, Green View, Grand View, sorry, Street. Um, so this is uh, a utility easement, an FPL utility easement running north south. Um, north of Jackson Street and all the way south. Our recommendation is to convert that as an open space accessible by walk for people to walk and to bike. And uh, in, along that corridor, we have some options. Option A uh, shows uh, stormwater infrastructure uh, and dedicated uh, biking path separated from walking and a mid-block crossing, which is elevated. Um, the second option shows a chicane and a Third option, so there's no third option in this one. Sixty <laughs> first um, Street. What we have here is um, very similar uh, options: a multi-use path on the option one. It still has uh, stormwater infrastructure, trees, uh, uh, street lighting, a stop sign at the end of the intersection here. Um, the option two is a chicane. Uh, chicanes are um, it's a winding path which uh, really just helps uh, with slowing the vehicles down. Um, we heard speeding is an issue. And um, here in option three, there, the se there's a separated uh, bicycle, bicycle path uh, post as opposed to a multi-use path. So in major intersection, Jay, would you like to just talk about what we have here? Yeah, so we're going to look at major intersections. These are the ones uh, you can imagine that are uh, large intersections signalized today for the most part. And um, really three options, uh, what we have here. Um, the third option, option C, is do nothing. Um, so we want to keep that option in case people <laughs> really like what's out there. I have a feeling we might not get very many people um, saying that that's their preferred option. Uh, and then the other two are essentially replacing those with roundabouts. These are really a fantastic safety treatment and great for pedestrians and cyclists as well. And um, could work at these at some of the, the major intersections. And then the other option really is to keep the signals in place, but do some geometric changes. So it might mean changing some of the access. A lot of these signals have driveways within a few feet of the intersection. It likely means improving uh, the pedestrian crossings, the pedestrian push buttons, the walk signals, don't walk signals. Some of the signals have those out there today, some don't. Uh, and also looking at signal timing, some of them, especially the, the very large intersections. When you, when you get a walk signal, it's hard to get all the way across before it changes it to don't walk and, and a red light and you might be trapped out in the median <clears throat> and then looking at other um, uh, options for essentially narrowing up those intersections making them a little smaller making them a little accessible more accessible for cyclists and pedestrians Thank you. kind of similar for the minor intersections uh, these are some of those intersections like 65th 57th where they have 
uh, traffic signals today, uh, but they're in their neighborhood. They're not as large. Uh, these the option on the left is compact roundabout. These are the roundabouts that have the fully traversable center islands, so a truck or a school bus could drive straight over, and it doesn't uh, preclude their ability to, to use the intersection, but again, a great uh, safety treatment also helps traffic flow really well all day long in the peak hour, and then the off-peak, kind of middle of the afternoon, middle of the night, you don't have to stop and wait at a traffic signal or stop sign. Um, the middle option, option B, essentially would be taking out any kind of stop sign, stop control on Jackson Street, but making sure we're providing a really high quality, safe pedestrian crossing at that location. This might make sense in some, some areas. It might not make as much sense in other areas. Uh, but if we take away the, the, the need for cars to stop on Jackson Street, we, we want to make sure we still have uh, a really uh, easy, safe crossing for pedestrians at that location. And then option C on the right is converting these to four-way stops. We have a number of four-way stops on the eastern end, uh, very safe type of intersection. Um, sometimes drivers can be frustrated because they always have to stop, but it is a really, really safe uh, type intersection. It's one that's out there uh, today. When you talk about traffic operations and co-benefits, can you explain what your, what your criteria is? Yeah, so the traffic, traffic, so when we have um, the kind of star rating on those, uh, traffic operations really how good is traffic flow. So, you know, the example with the four way stop, everybody has to stop. It doesn't flow great. It's a good safety treatment. It's very inexpensive to install, um, but it doesn't have the best traffic operations compared to a roundabout. We're talking about co benefits. We're looking at other things like the ability to um, do placemaking, um, kind of public <coughs> art uh, options, um, stormwater areas for stormwater treatment. Um, so why does the roundabout get the co-benefit for placemaking? So the roundabouts really provide a nice gateway kind of feeling. So for example, if we put one on Old, old Quarry Road where the traffic signal is, is there today, um, you're coming off a of New Warrington, turning onto Jackson Street, driving down, um, you really get the idea, you're going through this compact roundabout, you could put some uh, something on the corner, some kind of monumentation, signage, something like that, that really gives you a good feeling that I'm entering some a, a place that's much different. It's not, uh, you know, a high-speed county road. It's not like, you know, a highway. Um, it really gives you a, a good gateway to the neighborhood. So that's kind of one of the, the co-benefit on that side. And so traffic operations, just one more time, is the old... The more cars we move, the more you like it. Yeah. The more stars it gets. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we can do something that's like a compact roundabout that makes it safe, has those co benefits, gives a kind of a gateway effect, can make it um, good for pedestrians and cyclists, and it can move cars really efficiently, I think that's really a win for everyone. Um, you know, obviously there's cost involved in these things. Um, but uh, you know, look at something like a four-way stop, there might be some more trade-offs where some, you, you might end up getting some complaints later on if this gets installed. Um, so you know, we're, really, we're definitely not focused on how can we improve traffic operations out here to the detriment of other users, but if we can make the traffic operations work well while still making it safe for the other users, that's really kind of our goal uh, primarily. So what are you asking of the city, particularly? Buy-in. Today, uh, with you, we would un like to understand if there are any challenges with what we are proposing. Is there anything that, will, um, that you will support or not support? So we want to understand that and use that input along with the community's input to then go do our recommendations and draw the conceptual plan. So with, with these treatments, um, is there something you would like to see or not like to see, is what we're asking today. From my own experience, because my neighborhood has a new roundabout, a compact one, it has tons of complaints, tons of traffic issues, um, a lessening of people being able to cross the street, and the public from the beginning till now just wanted stop signs mm -hmm. and they're still so the traffic circle and the compact roundabout did not lessen the
the desire for the stop signs, if anything, it perpetuated it. Because now the, tri the circle never stops. Cars never slow down. And so people are actually having a harder time crossing the street. Mm -hmm. And um, so as much as they look nice, and I don't know if this is uh, how Southerners handle roundabouts or, or what the deal is, but we don't do a great job of these. And they are expensive. Ours was 2.5 million or so. And people really wanted a, I don't know what, a $50 stop sign. <laughs> so there is a, and we're doing a new traffic study just to exactly go back and do that. Um, I think with that one um, in particular, I agree with you. I use that one going into the soccer park uh, you know the park there to play soccer um and i think it's almost too compact people well, that's what people this, don't even really i, know, so I, I agree yeah. people don't even have to like turn to go around it they just go straight through it oh. um and the people that are so used to having gone straight there for so many years they don't they don't even pay attention to people that are coming around uh to maybe turn left um I think design-wise, yeah. That's, well, that's it doesn't, and, and, I, and as an engineer, I, I know that you'd be looking at this, but it doesn't meet the standard criteria. Like a lot of times we throw these roundabouts in that don't have equal um, traffic on from all directions. And so this one has much more traffic mm -hmm. in the east-west path than it does in the north-south. So the east-west just flies through thinking it's theirs, and it makes for an incredibly dangerous situation. So I would be cautious about a roundabout. There is one roundabout on the west side over there off 57th, a small little roundabout that's been there forever. Um, it would be interesting to ask the people. Do you guys know where I'm talking about? Anybody? Kevin, where is it? You're, you're right. It's right about there. About 57th, maybe a couple, three blocks off Jackson? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and I would I would point out that these I say compact roundabout, but what we have in that picture is still about a hundred foot diameter. So if you looked at mo some of these inter signalized intersections like 57th or 65th appear to be large enough that this would work, but it it definitely wouldn't be the kind of traffic calming circle where we just sort of plop down a, a circle in the middle of a, an existing intersection. So these would definitely be more substantial. But I think your comments are well taken. Yeah, this, it, you're talking diameter um, across from the outer side or the inner side? Outer? That's from the outer side, yep. Yeah, I, I would imagine that the one on Langley is at least that. I, I do think that this is a, an important project and a great connector from, from east to west um, in the city and the county. Um, there's a lot of people that live along that corridor that don't have cars. Um, that probably, you know, use public transportation that might not, um, if if they had the ability to hop on a bike or walk a few blocks um, safely. So I do think that, that this is, is something that's important, and I'm I'm excited about it. Um, I also think that it could be a good opportunity to connect to another trail that may happen uh, along Scenic Highway, uh, and really could be a connector all the way from uh, Escambia Bay to Perdido Bay. For, for folks, so um, a couple things that just looking at these, I want to ask: Can we just like fill this out and turn it into you if we don't, if we can't make it tonight? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we would love for you to join so you can hear what the community yeah. says. But if you cannot, I'll try to listen. We'd be well, happy but, yeah. to take those uh, okay. uh, input. Absolutely. Great. And we do have a second part of our presentation and workshop, which is going to be about financial planning. So mm -hmm. we're not quite done yet. Okay. Just a heads um, up. Just, yeah, so a couple things. I, I think anytime we can separate the, the people on bikes and the people that are walking, it'll be important. Um, you know, even if it's just a really wide multimodal path, you're going to have groups of people that spread out across it, whether they're on bikes or they're walking, and, and that can make some conflict. So I like mm -hmm. where, even if it's not separated by a curb like some of these are, you just have half of it painted green and half of it not painted. I think that's something that could be beneficial um, just to, to keep that separation and keep the conflict. Um, we were just talking about scooters last night and conflict on sidewalks. Um, and a lot of those sidewalks are wide, but people just don't realize mm -hmm. that they need to be from one, to one side or the other. So I think that's all I've got right now. And to that, if I may, it, when you're looking at like on the Grand View, option A, opposed to something like the 60, well, even on the 61st, A and B, I think um, 
people feel safer on sidewalks when you've got the buffer of greenery and trees between the street and the sidewalk instead of having the sidewalk come all the way to the street especially when there's no parking there mm -hmm. so there's nothing that gives that feeling of protection for safely um, just to be yes. sure that and and in option B you wouldn't really ever to be able to get a tree canopy in that scenario that's correct and I do think that the tree canopies and the canopy streets are becoming more and more important as we're getting hotter and hotter Absolutely. for people to be able to be on those kind of corridors. It's point well taken. So option B definitely shows um, no green space separation between the multimodal path and the travel lane. On the, that space was allocated to the other side of the street, so we have about 8 12 feet of green space makes for a large swale area for storm water. So understanding the preference or preferences, just like you mentioned, would help us design that accordingly. That adds in a chicane too, right? So the, Correct. Yes. Yeah, and those are absolutely nice. I mean, anything like that that slows, calms traffic. So, so would this be a phased project or? Yes, ma'am. Um, so definitely the next steps, after, once we start laying out the conceptual design, part of our recommendation is going to be a phasing plan um, for design and for construction, as well as looking at what the funding opportunities would be um, and any supporting ordinances and um, policy changes that might need to go in order to make this project successful. So that will be the next steps over the, next, uh, over the summer. Uh, where are you thinking about the funding opportunities? So we have a separate section. Okay. Uh, we will walk you through what we are thinking as far as funding. Um, we want to just run through the segment. So traffic calming is a, uh, we talked about if, uh, safety at intersections. Slowing down the vehicles is going to be a big part of our solution. So that will happen between the intersections along segments. And we have some suggestions here. Jay, if you can walk us through that. Yeah, so some of the, the cross sections that Catherine showed earlier incorporate some of these elements of traffic calming like the chicanes, but just especially um, asking a further question to the public, which of these things do they prefer? Um, Mid-block crossings with the refuge islands, um, this picture is um, from Via de Luna, um, using the rapid rectangular flashing beacon, um, those are um, you know, something like that, or the, the, the signs that have the LED lights that flash around uh, the perimeter, um, but a flashing beacon, you might not have the, the refuge island, the median island out there, uh, but you could still have a, a warning beacon that's very visible to drivers uh, or the chicanes. So just another uh, question when you're looking at mid-blocks, not specifically at intersections, what are people interested in? Thank you, Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Bobolus. I, I wanted to thank Councilwoman Brer for always advocating for the trees. I've never lived in a place before where people, particularly planners, and I don't mean to pick on you folks, architects, planners, designers, all consider trees problematic. It, it, it's just mind-boggling to me to this day that trees are a problem in Escambia and Pensacola. I'll never get it. Two nights ago, we had a cyclone in Navy Point. You're not going to hear it reported. It wasn't a big one, but it did sound like a freight train coming through. And the reason that we knew that it was a cyclone is because the giant palm tree of my neighbors next door broke it up and kept us probably from having serious damage on our driveway and maybe to the front of the house. It took a haircut in the middle of the palm tree and it spread 40 or 50 fronds 
three houses. These things were everywhere. That's why you know it was a twister, because it made no sense. It was not a straight line sort of thing. It also just ripped some of the palm fronds apart. Like 10 or 15 of them were just mangled and ripped up in pieces. And if that tree hadn't have been there, I don't know what kind of damage. We didn't even have a piece of our lawn furniture out front tip over with that kind of wind because that tree took the hit. It's so important. The undergrounding is so important. And it's really, I know that we like to be polite and say that FPL is trimming the trees. They're just hacking them down. Dozens and dozens of trees. I mean, what did they just, uh, uh, Commissioner Bergash managed to save half of the trees that they were going to take down on Perdido Key, and I think that left us with 38 of them being removed or something insane like that. And I also really wanted to thank um, the planners for noting the problem with the public transportation. I mean, it's just ridiculous that a street of, of that nature with those demographics doesn't have more. Those of us who have been fighting for ECAP for years over at the county would love some city support on helping us get more routes over there. So when you say that those those stops are, um, you know, they're not ADA accessible, they need work, you just described almost every stop on the west side and in some of poor areas of the, the county. Um, just quickly on the roundabouts. I know David doesn't want to hear me get going on roundabouts. They always promise the world with roundabouts. It never uh, often does not happen. It's always supposed to be better pedestrian and bike, and then look at what we got at 17th. Um, what they never say is that they are absolutely guaranteed, and it is a fact that they will increase accidents anywhere that they're put. It's just that they're not going to be the serious accidents, right? Not T-bones, but side swipes and everything else will increase. And so I would just beg that people continue to look at whether these things are really needed or they're just the newest design craze. They're the new clover leaf, right? Yeah, they look pretty. Um, they're great for everything but driving in basically. Um, so I would just hope that people will think about that. But the number one thing is we've got to start planning for the storm resiliency. And the last thing I want to ask with a question, because maybe David knows this, this is not a rhetorical question. Is there anyone in the city and the county who is actually looking at our area long term to see where all the cars are going to go after we do all the road diets? They're great individually, but living on the west side with the congestion that we already have, now we're going to get pace dieted because somebody's probably going to buy up the marina and put a bunch of expensive condos there, so we got to gentrify that street, right? We're never going to get Gulf Beach Highway four-laned, apparently, especially if they move that state road to the base, which I hope to God they don't because, you know, BRAC will be not long behind. We don't ever get any traffic fixes that move traffic on the west side. Now, hopefully, Commissioner Bergash will get Sorrento moved up the TPO list because we need that so desperately. We got, we got nowhere to drive. And so this project is so important for that neighborhood. I don't, I'm not trying to diss it. it. They need it, and especially the sidewalks. And so I'm not saying, oh, don't do anything there. But is anyone looking at where all the cars are going to go after we die at all the roads? Where, where are the more bigger roads going to come so that we can actually move traffic around the area? Thank you. Before you all got here, we asked for cards, so you can just come up. State your name, and if you're a city or county resident. Uh, county resident, uh, Kevin Wade, 413 Southeast Boblets. Um, uh, county resident, April 1st of 94. I've been here since then. Um, prior to that, I'm an eighth generation Vancouverite who grew up mostly along the West Coast. Eugene, Oregon, bicycle friendly. And I'm sorry, I should have said earlier, you have three minutes. Pardon? And you have three minutes. Three minutes, okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Pensacola, not so bicycle friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Not so bicycle friendly anywhere, Pensacola, honestly. Um, your neighborhood is eh, a little bit. Um, I, I feel for you trying to like build something better when 
at the other end of this, you have the confluence of Crow Road, Fairfield, <laughs> and West Jackson. <laughs> That's not friendly for pedestrians, bicycles, automobiles, buses, or the multitudes of trucks traveling on it, for sure. Like, that is a horrible intersection. Uh, the I, the uh, roundabout that I know of near that area is very close to where you were saying, Councilwoman Prayer, and uh, the one I know of is a triangular roundabout. Um, the residents hate it. <laughs> um, they do. They do not like it. Um, I, I find it telling and odd that the conceptual drawings show people walking, um, wheelchairing, bicycling. There's bicycle racks on the side of the streets. There's plants in front of tenements. I. I I don't know it, um, but not one photo in this flyer has a person in it that isn't in an automobile or a truck uh, on the photos that were taken of it. Now, there, there happens to be a, an intersection with the big red hand for uh, pedestrians do not get to cross at this point. Um, at an intersection where there are very few people that that cross Jackson there are so many people that end up needing something done along Jackson absolutely for sure and I really I would I would like to see consistency I want to see bicycles and automobiles on the signs everywhere like the occasional bicycle on a yield, and the occasional automobile. You, it seems like there's trucks with the circle and the slash through it. Um, but uh, walking around Manville recently, I noticed that many, many signs had bicycle up there on the sign as well with the stop. And you know, it's like get bicycles in people's minds somehow. Um, and get some more trees because the the lack of trees in the photos definitely do not jive with the conceptual drawings showing people hanging out in front of a bistro alongside a street that look nothing like any business in any of these areas and yeah if you build it they'll come um, not many of them are coming on bicycles, and a lot and a lot of them are s trying to run to get to the next bus stop. Thankfully, we have bus drivers who will pull over to pick people up um, outside of stop sign or the actual spaces. trees so someone else is talking um i don't remember where you're from miss prince uh, i'm from south florida i live in hollywood in i'm from kansas city okay and i asked that for a reason because in this particular area um there have been incredible studies on the resilience caused by trees you know post storms and such so uf did a um probably the most extensive, the year of Ivan when we had the five hurricanes within this region all at once, it enabled them to do a really compact amount of studies at one time to see the resiliency and what it did. And, and um, what Ms. Pino described is exactly, is exactly true, that the storms come down, like they'll throw the tornadoes, the tornadoes come down, touch the top of trees, go back up. And, and preserve the, um, the buildings and such in a, in a better fashion. But they have, the, they've listed all the most important trees, the live oaks, the magnolia, I think live oaks, magnolias, actually the, um, the palm trees do do an amazing job in the wind, they stand, but, and then there's other trees that stand, but their tops pop off. So you don't have the big damage from them, but you have, but, but really and truly in this particular region, the Southern Magnolia and the Live Oak that are allowed to sprawl have the, have the most protective 
um, measure against uh, against storms. So the most resiliency. And on, and I'm going to go back to that same idea. When you pair those two, if we underground that corridor with the utilities and insist that the utilities are undergrounded there and then we are able to plant trees like that because we can't really do the live oak or the southern magnolia close to the street if we've got overhead um, utilities but if we can pair those two together we really do have a plan for well well into the future that um, I mean it's a really an amazing idea and an opportunity since we're, we're in there doing that anyway that's what I would really can't stress enough the importance of something like that. And two, I think that what Mr. Wade was saying is, I mean, we do have the extreme temperatures. And so no one really wants to sit adjacent to a street <laughs> unless they have a tree overhead. I mean, it is very, very hot, so. Understood, and um, part of our next step, uh, moving into the summer, when you, start, when you start drawing out the design, is to work with the city and the county arborists to make sure any trees that we are recommending are appropriate and can thrive within the right of way. So it's very different than growing in the front yard. It, it has, is. So we want to make sure that they'll thrive, provide those additional co-benefits, be it storm water and shade, that is the right tree. Have you been through the tree tunnel locally on 12th? Not yet. Not uh, yet. <laughs> well, you need to do it. I did you send her a it. picture. <laughs> um, we have a second portion um, on state of the market. Part of our study is also how can we revitalize some of the uh, parts of Jackson Street. Uh, we have some experts who are joining us virtually. Uh, we'll talk about the market analysis, what we saw, what the opportunities are for the next few uh, decades, <coughs> as well as um, keeping an eye for unintended consequences. When we make improvements and pro uh, propose great things, there are always, uh, sometimes um, not the best outcomes that we don't keep an eye out for. So we want to make sure that we, as we take steps forward, we are back checking to make sure we don't have any, any unintended consequences, uh, top of which is gentrification. And then we'll jump into our game plan, our suggested game plan for uh, funding strategies. So with that, um, Charles, uh, are you hold, online? Hold on one second, because we yes. did just have the um, public input part, and you know this meeting was set from three o'clock to four. But if you would like to continue, Councilman Brayer Hill, and he's okay with you as far as scheduling. Okay, yeah. so we can continue. Thank you, ma'am. Charles Warren. Uh, thanks so much, Scott. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Charles Warren. Uh, my background is in uh, land use, finance, and economics, and trying to understand um, why some types of get buildings get built where they do and others do not. Um, as part of uh, a preliminary analysis for this project, we conducted a market analysis um, in which we looked at databases going from uh, 1980 through 2021. Um, we looked on the supply side, um, thinking about how much square foot of new office space or how many new apartment units or hotel rooms um, get, average, get built in the average five or 10 year period. Um, and on the demand side, we looked at data from the Census Bureau and uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics to understand uh, how many people are moving into the area, um, how many jobs, how many businesses, and what those growth rates have been. Um, we divided the Jackson Street Corridor, as you can see on the map, um, into study area east, um, which has more of an urban street grid and is more part of the city area, and study area west, which has more suburban street design and uh, focuses more on the county land. Um, we looked at the growth in the Pensacola region as a whole and then tried to understand um, how that is most likely to be allocated into the study area. Um, uh, essentially, um, from a historical standpoint, um, the Pensacola region has been growing between 0.5 and 2% and a year, which is sort of an overall average growth rate. Um, there are parts of the country that are reaching 5 6% a year. There are parts of the country that are negative um, a half a percent a year, so that puts Pensacola right in the middle. Um, for the last 20 years or so, most of the new demand 
um, has been built in suburban sprawl, and a lot of that has been taking place in um, Brent and, and, and Ensley. Um, to get specific about the Jackson Street corridor, on study area east, um, there's a very sparse history of new development, um, a lot of um, historic building, a lot of vacant lots, um, a lot of areas that have not really been um, renovated or rebuilt. Um, the history of study area west tends to concentrate um, in two areas, uh, around Mobile Highway and Fairfield Drive, where there's been a lot of uh, retail development, and around New Warrington, Navy Boulevard, and Highway 98 section, um, where there's also been a lot of new development, and then in the far west areas where there's been some green fields. Uh, so that's it for that. That slide, can we advance, please? Thank you. Um, just to take a quick look at what the future um, might look like, if we've been growing at about half a percent to one percent per year, um, and a certain amount of that has been happening in the city area east. What we see um, is that over the next uh, 20 to 40 years, um, there might be a handful of new apartments, um, uh, some new retail spaces, um, something that uh, scales to about the size of a couple Walmarts to give a sense. Um, these are not parts of the city where, and, and county where a lot of um, industrial or office uses have been developed. Um, so that's sort of study area east. Um, and on the next slide, we can also look at study area west, um, where we see the forecast for um, retail and hotel um, would be a little stronger. That's due to um, a history over the last 20 years of most of the um, new retail and hotel developments uh, being in study area west. So to the extent that the future will be somewhat similar to the past, uh, we would expect things to continue that way. Um, unless there were some major efforts to make zoning changes or policy changes or economic development changes. Um, so to give a final um, summary, um, what we see overall is um, a, not a huge uh, amount of new development expected. We do not um, really see market forces um, trying to uh, come in and develop this area. Most of it has been going on in um, northeastern part of Pensacola um, or in the immediate suburbs. Um, however, just because that has been the past um, does not necessarily mean that it will be the future. And there are two um, uh, uh, risk factors that might create some pressure for new development that could in turn uh, generate gentrification and displacement. Um, one of them is the proximity to downtown. So um, if and when downtown redevelopment and placemaking fills in, um, the next few blocks might move into uh, what we're calling study area east. And then second, of course, is that Jackson Street is at a higher elevation. Um, and if some future uh, forecasts for sea level rise do indeed prove accurate, um, then uh, that could be a definite change in the real estate landscape of the area. Um, so we would like to know, um, did, did we miss any major neighborhood considerations? Um, has there been development that we don't understand? Does that sort of report on the last 30 years and the trend line jive with um, what you're seeing locally and on the ground? Mr. Jones, do you remember the number on how many apartments are in uh, under review and development right now? Was it, weren't we nearing? We are close to 1,000. 3,000? Yeah, oh. Well, that was some Pre of the Pre-hot shots, so. Yeah. We probably do have about 2,500 units um, that are in the, Victoria? Does that seem right and sound right? Twenty five hundred units existing or being permitted? Be well either under development right now or already permitted. I don't I don't have those numbers, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's, we can get them for you, it is certainly. A lot. So I don't know if you saw those or not, but that would be something of interest. They're all within um, the Jackson East side is really you're really going to find those. The only other consideration is um, we haven't been able to fill retail space in, for example, Southtown ever. 
And I, I think that that coincided with COVID-ish and then a um, continuation of people just being used to purchasing online maybe. But they've never, we've never been able to continue, we've never been able to fill quite a bit of the ground floor space in the last couple of years. So that would be a consideration. Those are the only ones that I don't know if those show in your economic um, review. I think one of the things he said was, you know, the, this is what to expect unless some major changes in zoning or community development. I don't remember the words, but um, I think that's kind of a lot of what we're looking at is making changes so that we can build more housing because we have a huge need for housing, right? Um, less of a need for retail space, um, probably less of a need for hotels on that side of town. And we had a review the other night for a potential uh, rebuild infill of Baptist Hospital's campus of potentially as many as 900 units, mm -hmm. right? Yep. The other day. So um, the, when it says number two about um, the faith-based organizations, in, in other cities, what have you seen and how were faith-based organizations able to contribute? Um, so, I'm sorry, the, the, the I'm next sorry, part I wasn't, yes, the next session, part. Right. Yes, I'm going to get there. Um, if you have some ideas on how it Leverage partnerships to get to where you go. Ali, if you would walk us through. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Riley. I'm part of the Race Peace and Climate Resilience team. I'm going to walk through some of the kind of initial analysis we did around climate gentrification. Um, so, building off of what Charles shared, um, the market analysis didn't really indicate any kind of clear trends in market-induced gentrification, um, but I know that we've heard from outreach that some folks on the ground are seeing that in their neighborhoods, um, and so I think it's important to note that you know gentrification can mean displacement, but it can also mean you know neighborhood character change, um, and so here are some of the risk factors that we identified that could kind of um, facilitate gentrification. Um, including the Jackson Street improvements, smoke induced pressures, and then um, the climate change induced pressures, which I'll, I'll speak to. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so, uh, just to start, uh, climate change induced gentrification is um, kind of an occurring phenomenon, as you all might know, um, being in Florida, um, that we're starting to see areas where. Um, areas of lower risk with respect to chronic stressors like sea level rise and storm surge um, are becoming uh, more valuable um, with respect to the market um, over time. And I think we've seen some of this in Southeast Florida. And so um, part of our analysis um, was really kind of doing a first pass of understanding kind of the relationship between some of the demographic changes in the corridor over time historically and thinking about that in conjunction with the um, kind of future projected risk of climate change. With respect to climate change, we really looked at um, the we used available data sources so that you're seeing the um, county storm surge data um, and also looked at sea level rise. Um, precipitation was not included, so that, that's a potential gap. Um, but really what you can tell from this uh, map is that Jackson Street, as you all know, <laughs> sits at a higher elevation than a lot of the surrounding region um, and might be poised uh, for um, higher market values with respect to climate change uh, due to lower risk. Next slide. Um, so our analysis looked at the climate risk factors, which I described, and also looked at historical demographic trends using uh, census data. Um, so we looked at uh, trends from 2010 to 2019, um, and moved across a wide variety of variable, variables, um, which you can provide greater detail uh, about in another conversation in the report we're working on. Uh, but I think the key piece I wanna to highlight today was that we see an area of potential concern with respect to gentrification um, in the eastern area of the corridor um, study area, where we're seeing that rents have gone up over time, incomes have gone up, and the percentage of minority residents has gone down. So this is, you know, definitely kind of a high-level first first go at this analysis. 
Um, but with respect to the fact that climate change um, might make Jackson Street a really um, desirable location for people to relocate to, um, this is something we wanted to flag. Um, and this, these trends could be due to a lot of factors, um, such as natural demographic changes. Um, you can see that maybe new renters are paying more, but you know, existing residents aren't paying that, that higher rent yet. Um, and also the kind of concern that maybe newer, wealthier, um, non-NRV residents might be moving in. Um, so I guess really the, the takeaway is that, you know, these are some trends that we're seeing, there might be some concern, there's a risk that climate change could exacerbate these trends um, and make them happen at a larger and faster scale. Pass it over to Peter. Good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Walt. Um, I've got a background in economic development and uh, transit-oriented development, and I was actually on the Newark Habitat for Humanity board for about six years. Um, I'm responsible for looking for opportunities for mitigation of some of these uh, gentrification trends. And uh, if we if we look at that and we, we see that there's some potential long-term trends, but also the the impact of the, the three risk factors that were identified, there are, there are essentially two ways to go. One is mitigation using policy, and the other is to be a little more proactive and uh, attempt to uh, sort of stimulate uh, development. On the left side of the screen, you'll see that there's a program. There are programs that currently exist that run through the CRAs for both the, the city and the county that address a lot of this. Um, there are state programs, there are federal programs that are accessible um, to, to, to uh, take care of both uh, affordable housing, but also for mitigating uh, cultural change and lost history. So there are really two ways to do it. One is to uh, provide access to these programs for developers and for um, individual landowners and runners, and the other is to, uh, from a public uh, infrastructure perspective, uh, fund art spaces, community spaces, and engage in historic preservation, but also uh, think about the historical markers and, and think about the, the, the cultural heritage of the neighborhood and how that can be preserved. Um, when it comes to the programs, um, one thought is potentially to have each of the CRAs as sort of a one-stop shop that would have a, a dashboard that would identify the, the local, uh, the state, and the federal funding um, when I look at the, the websites now, it, it's strictly the, the local funding that's identified there. And it, it's a little tricky to get around that. So that may be a, a, a something to think about. Um, but then when it comes to the proactive side, um, and this goes back to uh, some of my background in affordable housing, um, it, it may make sense to partner with some of the faith-based uh, organizations that are along the corridor. Right? But, took a look at it, I saw about 10 of them that seemed to be uh, proximate to Jackson. Um, and also, uh, think about engaging the affordable development uh, community. Um, you know, there is a, the coalition of affordable uh, housing developers for the state, and it may make sense to create some kind of formal approach um, and really look at what potentially could be constructed to um, uh, create the affordable housing up and down Jackson. And there probably are two models. Uh, one would be the single, single family lots and that kind of more akin to the, the Habitat for Humanity model. But the other is that uh, in kind of looking at this really from the, the desktop, um, it, there appears to be about 14 uh, sites, 14 lots that are, you know, let's say between 15,000 and about 60,000 square feet that could um, lend themselves to uh, multifamily affordable housing. So the idea would be to partner up a faith-based organization with uh, one or two of these sites that's proximate to their location, and then also bring in the uh, affordable housing developers to kind of really begin to uh, move the ball forward to see if there's an opportunity to uh, develop these sites as affordable housing. Of course, uh, bringing in the, the, the counties and the cities um, programs that uh, effectuate for affordable housing as well as um, state and federal. <laughs> and now I'm going to pass it over to, oh, I, well, I guess I've got to ask the question before I pass it to Fonzie on the, uh, the, the funding. So do these partnerships, this notion of <laughs> partnerships, local partnership, but also to uh, a 
bringing in the the active affordable the state affordable housing developers um do you see this as a viable approach um do you have some thoughts about that and is there, did, are there other partnerships that you would recommend i would say regarding habitat um they have started uh taking some of the vacant property that's owned by the county and developing um, housing from that. Uh, their goal this year is something like 54 houses. Um, that's a lot. That is a lot. It com and it's a lot more than they've had in the past, so it's a, a really great improvement. Um, I don't know that they would be enough, you know, so I'm hoping um, I'm not aware of your Florida Coalition of Affordable Housing Developers. Um, are any of them in this area, do you know? Some are in the, in the northern part of the state, you know, um, in between Jacksonville, Gainesville. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen any active in Pensacola, so that, that's really where the marketing comes in. I think that uh, the CRAs would have to do is to really actively go after them. It is called the Coalition of Affordable Housing Providers. Providers, okay. Yes. Actually, are you CAHP. What? Um, the, the acronym is CAHP. It would be we interesting. Can, we can send you a link to their website. I would like to see that. With like the affordable, the six units that are going in right now mm -hmm. in the old church. Uh huh. Yeah. That would be interesting for those young developers to get involved with something like that and bring it this way. That would be. Yeah, you know, we're, we're looking at fairly small sites, so it, it, we'd, we'd be talking about six, eight, 12, maybe. 24 on the outside in terms of the size of these developments. They're fairly small, and most affordable developer housing developers build larger. So that'll be the that'll be the challenge. But maybe if you create a collection of sites, you could get you know one developer involved in three or four sites to get a critical mass. You know because there's you know there's normalization costs and all that sort of thing that are fixed no matter what the size of the development is. So it's kind of creating some synergy and some you know inertia in a positive sense. Actually, what I was saying is that there's a group of young developers that are redoing an old church on A Street for six units to oh, okay, aim great. to be affordable housing is the whole point. I said it would be interesting if these young developers would create a coalition like that. It could be amazing. Mm -hmm. That would be, yes. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, though, when renovation is usually a little cheaper than ground up, so... Um, there, there may be a capital issue, but it's great that there's a, a group like that going. So. On those uh, 14 sites for multiple multi-housing, um, are any of them within the city limits, or are they mostly yeah. far west? No, they're about half and half. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And well, yeah, as part of the write-up, I will give you the addresses. I mean, the, you know, the follow-up is to, to, you know, understand the actual means and bounds of each site, the ownership, that sort of thing. The, you know the, the the ownership is a key aspect to that um but yes there's seven more inside um city and, and seven are in the county good glad to hear that any other questions Alfonso. And pass it over to Fonzie to talk about the financial planning if there are no further questions since we there we go uh, Peter if you would yeah. walk us through this first slide and um, Fonzie will take over the next slide thank you no, I believe this is Fonzie's uh, slide simple chart it has a lot of information um, all it says is our first step is to identify needs be it capital needs so how we go and build this project and then there's a second part okay we built it how do we make sure can we can operate it so that's the first part and because that portion is going to be completed as we do our conceptual plan and the next part is identifying where federal state dollars are available and what is the most appropriate grant that uh, we should go after? So there's a lot of money coming down from the bill grant, as you know, from the vets. We have a lot of uh, funds coming down from FDE, DEO, and the state. 
So how do we make sure that we match those brands with the criteria we have? Um, along with looking at potential partnerships and uh, non-government funding, which could be TIF districts, could be bonds, uh, it could be partnerships with non-profit or philanthropic organization. So we're looking at a holistic picture, and not just looking at uh, federal grants or local monies. So that's going to be our um, strategy when we come up with our financial planning. Alfonso? Thank you, Efren. So my name is Alfonso Hernandez. I'm part of the National Advisory Team for Grant Development and Management. We offer a third secret service to grant research or identification, grant development, food grant writing, as well as Cook Award, which is grant management. The type of funding is a bipartisan infrastructure law or DIL for sure. It's a once in a lifetime investment in our nation's uh, infrastructure and competitiveness. Provides major it provides a major increase across the 30 to 30 percent service impact authorization that will enable what we to advance much more needed infrastructure investment. Additionally, there are multiple competitive federal opportunities that may be of interest to the county and then various phases of, of, of projects such as uh, the planning, uh, scoping, design, engineer, construction, along with um, post-construction activities such as uh, operations and maintenance, which is kind of laid out in the slide. So we look at various funding opportunities, uh, competitive, specifically not formula, that exist uh, under BIL, and these are a combination of new programs under BIL and also half um, competitive grant programs such as Ray and Brick. And I want to highlight a couple of programs. So um, Protect is a uh, provides funding for competitive funding grant as well as competitive um, resiliency improvement grant. So it's the uh, purpose of making critical uh, transportation infrastructure, resilient to current and future weather events. And this also includes the transportation assets. Uh, we have to say that the uh, inoffal release any day now, so uh, currently May or early June without a uh, protect program. Another program was the uh, Reconnecting Community Pilot Program, which will enable recipients to restore community connectivity by removing electric building or mitigating highways or other transportation facilities that create barriers to community connectivity, including uh, mobility, access, or economic development. Uh, grants for capital construction will um, be uh, uh, greater than five million, or as funding grants for this program will be uh, two million or less. We are anticipating the NOFO, um, sorry, to use NOFO, a notice of funding opportunity, NOFO for sure, uh, in uh, the summer of 2022, so that's just around the corner as well. That being said, I'll hand that back to you, Catherine. Thank you. So uh, with that, we'd like to hear from you on um, the various funding mechanisms and instruments just shared with you. Are there any specific uh, mechanisms that you will support or not support? So, so would it be the city's would it be the city's responsibility to apply for these grants? It will be both the cities and the counties. And the uh, way we've broken up the corridor, the east end of the corridor is entirely city, and the west uh, center and the west is a county. So uh, either we work, uh, the city and the county will work together or go after brands separately. Yes. I just say any anytime we can get funding um, through a grant. I'm supportive of that. So whatever grant it is, let's get it. <laughs> and then what happens if we aren't able to get it? If we aren't able to secure it and then we have this plan? Um, it's a good 
question. So uh, part of our scope is to work with the city and the county first to identify the appropriate grants. We have special uh, folks like Alfonso, whose job is to write grants day long. And um, we'll make sure they're applied to the right grants so in the right way. And if we don't still get the grant, there's no guarantee that we go after the grants. We have um, options, right, we shared with you. It's going to be not just grants, it's also going to be looking at other financial options, be it bonds or um, tax increment districts, tip districts, or partnerships with uh, nonprofit organizations. So we will have a variety of many options to choose from. Um, and if we don't get the first step, perhaps we try again. How much success have you had um, getting grants for uh, affordable rental apartments where it would be more for um, hospitality industry types, a little bit lower than the workforce types? Um, seems like we have a, a lot of tourism here and a lot of uh, restaurants. Uh, we, we have an amazing an array of restaurants. and they are constantly advertising for help and part of the reason is people can't find a place to rent so how do you solve that with your abilities um, i'll pass the question on to peter walt the question is peter um, how successful or what have your experiences been in getting funding for workforce affordable housing rental for rental Well, the affordable housing developers have been successful in terms of uh, getting funding. It's 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 a sort of a specialized business, and we, you know that, that's why it's important to engage an affordable housing developer as opposed to a general developer that may want to do affordable housing or do a set aside. Um, I think your chances of success will be much greater that way. Um, the low income housing credit, <clears throat> I think, of cause causes a lot of people consternation if they're just not comfortable with it or familiar with it. Um, and typically affordable housing developers have a track record of being able to get that funding, usually working with the same uh, law firm that also has um, extensive experience in accessing those, uh, with that type of funding. You know, the, the low income housing credit is essentially is, uh, almost like free money because it's equity going into the, uh, to the transaction. As opposed to as opposed to uh, debt, so um, that, that would be my recommendation. Uh, you re reduce your risk um, by going with more seasoned affordable housing developers that can pro provide the affordable housing that can uh, reduce the cost of rental. What department uh, hands out these low-income housing credits? It comes out of the the Treasury Department. Federal. Federal, yes, but the, but, uh, the state of Florida um, uh, has a has is, has a program that's kind of a conduit to it. Mm -hmm. so you got the Florida Housing Corporation's funding and financing program, including included in that number one in that hit parade is low income housing tax credits. Mm -hmm. So they've got experience in accessing those. Thank you. The only other thing that's come up recently uh, is the idea of um, setting up a uh, housing trust fund. Um, and I'm not at all familiar with how to set one up or what the advantages are and why you wouldn't spend it all the first year because there's such a great need. If there's any way you can explain that to us, I'd appreciate it. If that's an interesting concept. Um, if, you, if, if you don't have deep pockets and you want to set up a housing uh, trust fund, I think maybe um, focusing on um, the time is money notion that developers have. So by putting um, a, a potential lot or a rehab through the approval process and focus on funding that piece of it, it'll be a lot easier for a developer to develop a fully titled lot that's ready to go, and as opposed to spending six months, eight months, 18 months getting it ready to go. 
So what you're doing is you're lowering the, 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 the barriers to entry for affordable housing developers. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Because that, that's usually what the developer has to pay out of pocket. You, you don't get funding for that. So if you're able to fund that, even before there's a, a, a transaction where the affordable housing developer buys the lot, I think that really, you know, I think that is probably the, the wisest investment or the wisest use of unlimited funds. Chairwoman okay. Broughton. May I step in, ask a question, Chairwoman? Um, this might be a question for Caitlin or, or Terry. Is this on any of our TPO project priorities? Is Jackson Street master plan on any of the TPO project priorities lists in any way? It is not currently on. <clears throat> Has there been any uh, discussion about attempting to add this to? Okay. For. I guess I was asking more about the corridor or the, I forget what the funding pot is called now, mobility. Right, right. The, the annual allocation. I guess, you know, this project would fulfill, you know, the corridor management plan purpose um, you know that's basically being completed so it would be the implementation dollars I think it goes back to um, no we can I think there's yeah I think it's something that maybe we can discuss about the implementation because I don't think it needs to be in any prior plan with these corridor management plans, like the long range transportation plan, I think with these CMPs. Yeah, I think we've been trying to, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's a little bit of a hurdle, but I think we're trying to just kind of bulldoze through that a little bit, I guess. So there's some other projects, so maybe in the outer years we can look at advocating for West Jackson. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure, to be honest. And this is just for, this is, this is the master planning phase. We don't have any design scope at this point. Okay. We should have that by the end of the coming back to you and that's the next step um, we'll be coming back to the commission the city council and county commission presenting our recommendations by October of this year so you have cost estimates at that time but it won't so, be so like so a, but it won't be like preliminary engineering plans it should conceptual yeah. okay thank you yeah I think it'd be worthwhile having maybe more discussion internally about the TPO dollars that are annually available to us, so. Uh, and the gentleman, uh, I forget, I'm sorry, um, your name. But Jay. Jay, Jay um, you, you, you spoke about uh, safety, and so I was just making wonder if there's this potentially avail opportunity for DOT safety funds or FHWA safety funds that are sometimes through our safety office we could um, apply for. I mean, obviously, safety is the number one concern, right? I mean, we want to we want to reimagine Jackson Street. We want to make it a vibrant uh, corridor, but we also want to make sure, first and foremost, that it's safe. Um, so I'm curious if there's an opportunity we can um, knock on the door of DOT and their safety office and see if there's some availability there. Yeah, absolutely. The Highway Safety Improvement uh, Program funding yeah. Yeah. Uh, may be a, a good uh, opportunity for this. I think the improvements 
we would recommend <clears throat> for that program you need to have a benefit a safety benefit cost Two over one yeah. um, so you know we would that that'll be part of this study is the analysis of what crash reduction we could potentially see and uh, as Catherine mentioned we had the cost estimates so we could show that preliminary benefit cost um, there's also some more funding coming straight from the bipartisan infrastructure law focused on safety the Safe Streets and Roads for All program is out now that does require a, a regional comprehensive safety action plan or a Vision Zero action plan to be in place to apply for funding. But um, <clears throat> if that if that is in place, uh, DOT is actually awarding funds that that notice of funding opportunity is out now is due mid September. Um, so you can apply for funds both for an action plan to develop that up to $1 million for cities and or counties and up to $5 million for MPOs. Um, so you could develop that this year and then that goes for all the next five years. And then they have implementation grants that are up to $30 million for cities and counties and up to $50 million for uh, MPOs. And because of the nature of that program, it's likely to be a lot less competitive than other programs that Fonzie mentioned, like the RAISE uh, program and others that are typically like 5% success rate. Uh, because you need these action plans in place and because of the amount of funding they have, there could be a lot more opportunity for safety-specific, Vision Zero-specific type projects like this in the future. But you do need to have that comprehensive safety action plan in place before you can apply for the implementation funding. Very good. Thank you. Just the next steps that we're done. Uh, the next steps, um, so um, listening to, to everybody's uh, suggestions and comments, also listening to the community um, comments later this evening. Um, we'll come up with some, uh, some recommendations, work with the city and county, the various departments, and then develop a conceptual uh, plan. And uh, as I mentioned, the conceptual plan will come, up, come with a set of recommendations on facing for design and construction, supporting policies and initiatives to make it successful, uh, along with the financial planning game plan. And we present these recommendations to your city council and county commission in October. Okay. So with that, uh, please join us in an hour at Brownsville Community Center if you can. Otherwise, we'll take your pamphlets to get your feedback. Uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, through Caitlin or Terry as necessary if you have any comments in the coming months. We would love to hear from you. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. And can we get the slides and I'll we'll forward them on to the All council right. members? So, and there are no more questions from the public? Okay, well, we're adjourned. Thank you. <coughs>